Thanks for coming out this evening. My name is Sadie Urban. I'm the events coordinator here at the Reserve. Um, this talk tonight is part of a year-long lecture series called the Ralph Newsom Lecture Series. It's funded in part by the Kickapoo Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant, and also the Friends of the KBR help out with refreshments in the lobby. This evening we have Dr. Jim DeLine here to talk to us about the Center for Special Children. It was established in Lafarge medical clinic in 2015 and it's one of six clinics like it in the nation so um, very impressive here in Lafarge. Well hello I know most of the faces I'm a family doctor I've been here in the community since 83 right out of my training program so I was 28 years old and full head of hair when I arrived and, and uh, <laughs> It's been, a, it's been a long haul, lots of interesting work. I want to introduce Tom Hare. Tom is a pediatrician who's joined us last year, two years ago now. And uh, so to a great extent, Tom is the brains of the operation uh, for this work with complex children. After getting married, I was looking for a new job to start a new life with my new family. And we found the job here. And I was really drawn to it because it's in a rural area. And they told me that I could work out in Lafarge with Dr. Line um, one day a week. Um, and once I got to see what the work was in Lafarge, it was really, I know it just really made me feel encouraged about what the possibilities to expand my knowledge about caring for special needs kids, um, but also, you know, that there was a way to serve that population, um, much as I serve the American Indian population. And I'm learning a lot about genetic conditions. Um, and the thing that I think about is, you know, what a tool this is would, it, would have been working with the Indian Health Service too. I'll spend a few minutes just setting the context uh, before I get into the details of the practice and the project. So we started as a small solo practice here in 1983, right out of my training program. There were basically three of us, myself, a receptionist who did basically anything related to paper, and then a nurse, or at that time it was a lab tech, who did everything else. So put the patients in the room, learned how to do x-rays, and did blood draws, and the basic things. So three of us for a number of years. As time went on, after about five years, I was able to hire my first partner, which was good, because basically we were 24-7 for those uh, five years working and responding to needs and emergencies and things like that. So quite a relief. Uh, we got busy enough that in 92 we actually uh, built uh, an addition onto our clinic uh, and that gave us a little bit more room to breathe so we about doubled the size of that. I didn't really realize at that time I'd been toying with the idea of starting a birthing center for a couple of years. My thought was to do this work at the hospital in Viroqua, uh, but to try to get something low cost for the Amish community particularly, because most of their birthing goes on at home. And I also worked in addition to the work here in town, five shifts a month working the emergency room in Viroqua. And there I would be receiving women coming in with complications of uh, delivery and birthing from these home birth situations. As I did that enough years, it was very evident to me that there was more uh, support needed to the community, the Amish community out uh, in the various areas around. So about a year into this, I wasn't able to quite get everything organized to get it started at the hospital. So we actually began doing it in the clinic, which wasn't my initial goal or my anticipation. This, uh, it says birthing center there, but that's actually a, a euphemism. Basically, it was an exam room in which we had a birthing bed and a little bit of room around the perimeter to, to, uh, to work with the rest of it. So it was pretty tight quarters, but uh, the Amish are pretty patient people and, and appreciative of the work for their sometimes complex uh, birth issues. So that, uh, Jim, yes. what brought you here? Why did you choose it? Well, that's a good question. I, I would say, just in brief, it was, the, it was the geography of the area. So we had made a trip going to actually Darlington, where we were interviewing for a, a, a position there. 
and we saw what beautiful country it was. So after I got done interviewing there, I actually got the map out and studied it and, and looked at all the places where healthcare was being provided throughout Southwest Wisconsin, called every hospital and clinic and explored what was available. And I was actually in, invited to come here by a committee that was hoping to find a doctor to come to Lafarge. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time studying the, the population, where all the healthcare services were, so I knew pretty well the entire region when I decided that this was an ideal spot. You had to go to the north, to Sparta, to the east, to Hillsborough, to the south Richland Center, and then west to uh, Viroqua. And then all that area in between had very little service. So it's actually turned out to be the case. I mean, of course, we, we've drawn in a lot of other kind of issues too, but it's really become busier and busier. So we actually... Uh, we're looking at a third practitioner in 2004, so this is 20 years into it. We were kind of growing out of our britches at that time, really. B, the practice was getting busier than I could really uh, manage. Uh, I was mostly focused on my work. I was not really, a, a, I would say, a particularly good manager. And, um, and the finances got to be a little challenging. I looked at, uh, at uh, affiliating with our local hospital, still a small rural hospital, Vernon Memorial, which is not uh, affiliated with Gunderson, nor with the St. Francis Mayo system, nor with the UW, but a small independent hospital, which was consistent with, with my kind of view of the world. So after 20 years in private practice, I joined the, our local hospital. Of course, I'd used them as a hospital for many years anyway, so we already had good, close working relationships. That really uh, allowed further expansion of the practice where actually uh, we have now five practitioners but we have another full-time doc starting in about two months which will be a great uh, help and a new clinic that we just moved into a year ago which is unbelievable and never really could have occurred without the support of Vernon Memorial. I mean we never could have managed such a thing in a, a small private practice. So the birthing program ties into the work I'll be speaking to in a moment, uh, and again, starting in 93, so that's been over 20 years ago. I work a lot with the midwives, so when I say midwives, I mean the Amish midwives, the lay midwives in the Amish community, as well as the, uh, the certified midwives throughout the region too. So if they have troubles or concerns, uh, they call and we try to assist them, and that's been going on for a long time. We currently do, it says 80 to 100, but I think just in June and July, we've delivered 30 mothers down there, so probably we're a little over 100 now, I would say, uh, per year, and a lot of very complex obstetrics. So this is, uh, this is quite interesting in that I really wasn't very interested in OB when I first started practice. I did it only because I was in a small community and I needed to. I never really realized I would be called upon to do that much work in that area. And the more I did, the more passionate I became and the more complex work I did. And it just grew and grew and it became a real passion for me. And so I've been uh, quite enthusiastic about the obstetrics work. Yes? Uh, VBACs are vaginal birth after cesarean, okay. and so these are women who've had a prior C-section and then have a natural birth afterwards. Okay. So it's a little bit of a difficult area. About 15 years ago, the American College of OB-GYN came out and made pronouncements about it that made it very difficult, basically shut down VBAC deliveries across the country so that they were no longer women able to access that sort of service unless they went to the large tertiary hospitals which is great as long as you live within maybe 20 minutes or so there, but if you're an hour, hour and a half away and you've had a number of babies, it's not very practical. And so that really, the C-section rate continued to skyrocket, partly as a consequence of the ill-advised kind of insights of the ACOG or American College of ob -GYN. They've actually now since a decade later gone back on that statement and said, well, maybe we were a little bit hasty in that. And, and as the, as the C-section rates across the country have hit 30 and 40 percent, uh, uh, and the maternal mortality is now starting to follow that. And I think at the federal level, they've said, well, something has to change with this. Please give us some leadership. And so they've kind of stepped back on that uh, guidance. So it actually ruined these VBAC births all across the country. Many hospitals don't, no longer do it, but we do still do it in Viroqua. And I actually started doing it in, in Lafarge. <coughs> Uh, without access to the hospital except by ambulance transport. But it took time for me. I didn't really want to do those kind of births in the clinic. Those are more complicated.
complicated Burks, and I, I, but eventually I, I did because I couldn't get them to go to the hospital. The new clinic uh, has just been about a year ago since we moved into that. We've got uh, 10 main exam rooms and then a back area where we've got two birthing rooms and another exam room and a conference room. And for some of the specialty clinics that are going on now, that's all happening in that back area while the full practice is going on through the rest of the clinic, plus an ER area there and a procedure room and lab and x-ray and things. So it's quite an amazing facility for such a small community. And it really couldn't have ever happened without our local hospital support and their confidence in the work we do. It's really a testament to, to our work and, uh, and we are really thankful for that. A bit about some of the current work. This is particularly with the Amish I'm referring to here. Um, since most of the subsequent work comments I make will be related to the Plain community, the Amish and the Mennonite communities. So with them, they may make up about 20% of the, of the patients that we see at the clinic. So even though we think about it as being a place where a lot of the Amish go, that's all true, but still 80% of our patients are not Amish. They are community members from all around the region. And in, with the Amish, uh, they tend to be there mainly for urgent care or pregnancy-related issues. So it's not very much of you know, like a yearly exam sort of thing. We don't see too much of that, but we do kind of request that they come in if they're getting meds for hypertension or other things. So we sometimes we'll at least see them once a year. But for the most part, the OB visits, you see about a quarter. Trauma, we see a lot of trauma care there acute illness, Lyme disease, and other illnesses, and that sort of thing. I would say in general they come in for very little compared to what we're used to seeing. It took time for me to learn how to do, manage that, but we do. Uh, but it's very common for them to come in at this stage of pregnancy, so the third trimester. Uh, they may not have had, well, almost universally have not had ultrasound dating. Some of them haven't even had any menstrual cycle since their last delivery, and of course dating based on ultrasound at that time is not very helpful. You have to be in the early first half of pregnancy in order to get good dates. So there's a lot of complicated issues with the Amish community, but part of our work has been, has been training and educating and trying to get um, greater participation with prenatal care. One of the ways that we did that, this has always been kind of a bargain basement process. So for many years we charged $650 for the birth. That's what it was. It included my nurses and IVs and whatever drugs we gave, all of that and all the time. So if it was a 18 hour birth, that's what the fee was. Um, there really wasn't much left for that at, for, at the end, you know, but that's the way it worked. And it was a service to the community and I learned. So basically I learned my obstetrics beyond my training from my patients. And so I never would have really uh, came to where I was if it wasn't for that gift from the patient. So in a sense, it works out well and we did just fine without that. And gradually it's increased a little bit in cost, but we folded in all the prenatal care, all the lab tests, ultrasounds that we do, all of that is folded into the price, which is now 1150 for the Amish 20 years later. So it's still quite a bargain. It might be five or 10% of what it would normally cost you at the at a hospital or something. These are, this is a map of some of the Amish communities uh, in Wisconsin. Um, the star is where we're at there. The larger dots are larger communities. So the, the one large one to the north and west of us, of course, is the Cashton community. You see the Kingston one straight east of us and uh, Dalton. Tom and I have spent quite a bit of time over in those communities working with families and having educational meetings and things. We've been down in Lancaster and Fenimore area a number of times engaging with the communities down there. And then quite a bit of work we've done up in the Augusta community and, and uh, adjacent to that. Just last weekend on Saturday, they had a large benefit auction for our project up in the Augusta Withy area and um, so there's we're working really with the Plain community all through the Wisconsin and really in the northern Midwest we're kind of catchment area for Minnesota and Iowa as well. Back in 2010 we began a series of meetings with the Amish communities not specifically uh, related to these genetic issues, but related to a wide variety of issues of concern to the Plain community, the Amish. So that could be anything from cost of health care at the hospital, ambulance transports, helicopter transports, certain things that they felt uh, uncomfortable with, uh, relationships, how long they would sometimes have loss of control over the care of their children, for example, which is a very common issue with these, with communities that maybe have different health perspectives than what we have. As a consequence of some of those meetings, there were discussions of these, all the children in the community who have undiagnosed 
conditions, um, which we weren't really sure what they were. We just know that there's maybe a child is not developing normally. We try to get them to the Weissman Center in Madison, which is kind of our regional center for uh, metabolic and genetic disorders. It's difficult to get them to go. It's a couple hours. After a long evaluation, they'd say, well, we can do this various testing. Well, how much will that be? Well, you know, it might be, you know, X numbers of thousands of dollars, you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollars. And of course, the yield, you know, might be kind of low. Uh, if you maybe make a diagnosis, the interventions, they're not that sure whether they're... So in general, that wasn't a real fruitful model. It didn't... We could get a couple people to go, usually didn't get a diagnosis, and it just didn't really seem to be working for the community. So Holmes Martin is a gentleman who basically spearheaded this work 25 years before we began this. He's devoted his life and career. He's a pediatrician, also a um, molecular geneticist, and someone who spent a lot of time in the area of genetics and pediatrics. And his entire career has been devoted to this work. He's really the world leader in this work. And we we decided to see if we could get him to come out for a conference here. We actually had this conference in October 2012 in Norwalk, if you can imagine, at the gym next to the what I think used to be the school and is now the community health center from, from Scenic Bluffs. And so this was the most unusual conference I've ever been at in that there were probably 100 to 150 uh, English, like they call all of us, uh, so these would have been physicians, nurses, midwives, university folks, uh, again, attorneys and, uh, from the health departments because these issues are important, in, like with management of children, um, local clinicians, things like that. And then there were about 150 Amish there. So, and there were Amish also on the speaking um, Things. So there were two or three Amish that did presentations. One, a gentleman from Indiana who did a presentation on the genealogy and followed through some of the uh, one particular genetic disorder called SCID, Severe Combined Immune Deficiency Disorder. He had three children with it, and he knew all about the genealogy of it and where it came from and where it, which uh, communities were affi afflicted by it. And uh, anyway, so it was a very interesting conference. We got then personally acqu acquainted with Holmes, and he's been kind of a mentor and, and acquaintance since that time, so we communicate back and forth. And uh, interestingly, after seeing our work here and the efforts that we're making, particularly with the birthing and caring for adult patients with these conditions, which these are all pediatricians, so that once they get to be 18 or so, they, they're kind of out of their realm. Um, so we've kind of come full circle in that Dr. Morton, Holmes Morton, is looking at setting up a new clinic in central Pennsylvania, and he's trying to emulate the work we're doing here, where we're actually doing the adult care, and they need trauma care, and they need help with birthing, plus informed care about genetic uh, disorders. So it's quite interesting how things have come full circle in that regard. We met also Dr. Wang, Heng Wang, from a small clinic in Northeast Ohio. I should mention, each of these clinics is in a community much like Lafarge. So the one in, in the, the world-famous clinic for special children, where they've actually diagnosed, they've got complete gene sequencing equipment in the basement, they've got, you know, PhD level genetic researchers working there, they've diagnosed or defined half of the known mutations in the Amish community, like over 100 diseases They've done it all in that little clinic in a small town about uh, the size of, of this area. Dr. Wang in, in the DDC clinic in Middlefield, Ohio, it's the same thing. They're right out. They could be literally just down the road like this in the rural area of northeast Ohio, right in the middle of Amish country. It's quite interesting. So people come in their buggies to Dr. Wang's clinic as well. A real gentleman. He also, uh, Dr. Morton was a mentor to him, so he came about 10 years after. He's an amazing professional person, very knowledgeable, and uh, all of these folks have been so helpful to us in our fledgling efforts to learn a little bit about these conditions. We began doing a little fundraising, just thinking, well, maybe we can do a little something here to learn something about these conditions, uh, get some consultation and other uh, assistance to learn a little bit more. Uh, and actually that says 2015, but that should be the fall of 2014 that Dr. Hare was hired. So he came in as our pediatrician with a lot of experience with special needs children. So that was a real turning point for us. You know, one of the things I really love to do is working with special needs children. Um, I enjoy advocating for them and working with the parents to make sure they get all the care they need. Um, 
in working out in Lafarge with the Center for Special Children has taught me a lot about genetic testing, um, working with a different culture, and cost-effective care as well as improving access to care. It's basically a clinic within a clinic, I guess you would say. So we have our busy, bustling practice that's going on. We're doing all the normal work and seeing patients and, you know, we have birthing going on and birthing rooms full and the emergency room going and conferences happening. At the same time, within that, we're doing this work, which is um, <coughs> developing knowledge for informed care for rare conditions in this community and meeting with families and doing genetic testing and having consultants come in at times to enhance and enrich the experience and for mutual learning and understanding as well. So that's all going on. The funding of that project is essentially separate from all the other work that we do. And though it's, and so it's basically underwritten by the community, by the auctions and by private donations. Organic Valley has been very generous, has helped us out with that. Other donations, a lot of time donated. So most of my time has just been all just donated donated time for the last few years for that. Early mornings, late at night, days off and weekends, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And it's been just fine. I mean, it's been very, very interesting work and, uh, and it's continuing to grow and learn. So these uh, discounted fees make it accessible for the Amish community. So between the, the revolution in gene sequencing, which has occurred as a consequence of the Human Genome Project, uh, which we thought would take so long to do, and as the, it basically became more of an IT project, and as that increased, they, it got faster and faster to do this work. Well now, particularly when we're looking at specific point mutations, and we have a relationship with Dr. Morton and Dr. Wang, who has his own lab, uh, we're able to do point mutation testing for certain, particularly Amish mutations, for $50. I mean, this stuff costs thousands of dollars. If you send it to Mayo or you send it to the West Coast for genetic testing, we can do this testing for $50 if we know what we're looking for. So that's, that's if we're looking for a specific gene mutation. It's a little more complicated if we have to do whole exomes and the analysis of that, which we'll get to. We can do that as well. So it's fully integrated in a, into this family practice. And if you want to know how it's going, you'll have to ask in a year or two, because we're not really sure. It's, <laughs> it's going OK, I think. And we're learning a lot. And we're seeing a lot of different patients. And, and now we're, we're dedicating more time. One day a week, as of the fall, I'm going to be dedicating the time to this. Tom is there dedicating it two days per week. Obviously, we kind of work it out the other days. And we see these kids whenever they need to be seen. But you know, the day may come where we have basically full time people doing this work, presumably primarily pediatricians, and I'm kind of the, the politician to shake the hands and kiss the babies and spend a little time with them. And I know a little bit of it, but mostly it's, uh, it's the relationship with the community and, and, uh, and some of the specific areas that I know more about, but most of them are truly in the area of complex pediatric work. So that, the other interesting thing is it's really dovetailed with our birthing program with the Amish community. So <clears throat> now we're getting all of these families with genetic disorders. And so now when they have a baby, they wonder, is my baby affected? We can simply do cord blood testing. So we deliver the baby, we draw some cord blood, $50, we send it off to the CSC or to the DDC clinic in Northeast Ohio. We know within three or four days or a week, is the child affected? If it's one of the conditions for which there are good treatments, we intervene in that. If it's one of the conditions, it's a lethal condition, instead of being ending up in the hospital in a pediatric ICU for weeks to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, which it turns out in retrospect is feudal care if it's a lethal condition. Their money is spent and they're, instead of being there, they're at home with their child you know, in the middle of winter or wherever they're at with their community, with their family, caring for their child in their own home and with a single visit and, and of course we can help for the comfort care for that child. So it really changes the life of these families when they can have informed care about the kinds of conditions that are important in their community. 
In addition, some of these people now are going on and getting pregnant themselves. So depending on the type of condition, some of these metabolic conditions, some of the cardiac conditions, now these women are pregnant. And the question is, what do you do with that? Well, there's not a lot in the literature about it. We've just done a publication on one particular condition called propionic acidemia. There's really nothing in the literature about it. So we're trying to figure out, well, how do we manage this? Well, you'd normally say, well, they should probably go to a place like, you know, Meritor or UW or Lutheran Hospital and do their, but that's not really what they're particularly inclined to do. Plus, they don't know much about these conditions either. So uh, this particular one, for example, we had a protocol that was outlined by the metabolic specialist at the Weissman Center for this condition. This was her first baby. And they decompensate during times of uh, what we would call catabolic stress, meaning you're burning up a lot more calories than you're taking in. So when you think about a labor, particularly a first mother labor, like 18 hours or 24 hour labor, that's a catabolic stress. So we had to design a plan that would be appropriate for such a patient. We actually ended up delivering them right in the clinic in, in Lafarge and uh, doing you know every hour blood testing and doing all the other kinds of things, infusions and certain medications, giving IV through the process to try to be sure we keep the woman and the baby stable and healthy. And then we publish that information so others can give us their insights, maybe they've done it and not published it, then we learn from that. We can do it a little better next time. Right now I have two patients with propionic acidemia who are pregnant. One with a weak heart and it's going to be, you know, we have a lot of very complex work that we're dealing with and good luck to us sometimes and to them. Um, our collaborators, of course, VMH, I could, as I said earlier, the, none of this work could really go on. So even though we're having discounted services and a lot of it is supported by the communities, the Amish and the English and others and the auctions, to be honest, a lot of that work is kind of underwritten by, by Vernon Memorial. So, you know, everything it takes to keep the lights on and to keep the staff and all the lab work and all that, that basically is just uh, being donated by VMH, which we really appreciate. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, a sense of giving back to the community for what, uh, for the, the, the good system and the good support that they get as well. So there's really a sense of community and giving back that is, it's not only Lafarge, other small communities they're reaching out to as well for supporting. Uh, in addition, University of Wisconsin is really our other primary uh, collaborator. So we work a lot with the Weissman Center. They come down about every two months, do clinics. They work kind of on an email and first name basis, you know, frequently uh, getting guidance and advice about particular complex problems. They're also trying to emulate the work that's done out east. So it's two small clinics out there. So now as we've had more of these patients developing, they're doing the developing the templates to do the testing locally. They're matching the prices. So we're sending the stuff as much as we can now right to UW. Of course, they want to build their genetics and their diagnostic skills. So they're becoming the place in, northern, uh, in the northern Midwest to do this work. So they get out of it too. I explained to the patients, it's not just free. I mean, there, there's, they get good of that as well. Plus they learn about these conditions, which enriches their practice and their knowledge base and such. So it's really a good collaborative relationship They've been great partners. And now I'm working particularly with the area of cardiology on a couple of projects that I may have a chance to mention. We also are working with a group called the Windows of Hope from Exeter, England. I actually happened to just meet them at one of the uh, national conferences I was at about three or four years ago. We just met at breakfast and we got chatting. I, the reason I sat down is there was a, a lady with a cap look looked kind of Amish and I thought, well, that looks like my kind of place to sit in. <laughs> so I sat and chatted <laughs> and we got acquainted a little bit and here this one had a British accent and, and we visit a little bit more. It turns out they've got this massive uh, research uh, foundation in Exeter dedicated to many things, but included in that is the learning of the genetic underpinnings of these rare conditions in the Amish community, which then, as they learn about these, these r have rippling effects all through our community. So the English and the, the, the principles that we're learning are applicable to the entire population. And so they, we got acquainted. We spent spend two or three hours the next evening communicating and, and visiting and talking about ideas and dreams and what might happen. And now they've been coming out and doing clinics here a couple of times a year, maybe more frequently depending on what our needs will be. In October actually we're spearheading a conference that will be for the more the, it's not a national conference, more for southwest Wisconsin for clinicians and others on the inherited disorders of the Amish community. So we'll have speakers from Exeter there from the university, Dr. Harrowby, 
uh, coordinating one of the sessions and I'll be doing another. And so kind of regional as well as consultants as well as the folks from Exeter and then inviting regional clinicians, so the docs, to try to spread the word on some of these conditions, uh, both for their knowledge as well as to know that we're here to help if we can help. The clinics I've mentioned just briefly out east, the two first ones, we've got uh, others that we're well connected with, and all of these clinics are, are staffed by pediatricians, so we're really the only ones that take care of these folks when they get to be adults, and none of them are doing obstetrical work. So they're all kind of looking at our work, even though we're just beginning, we're not very, we don't have a lot of experience or knowledge. Here's a few of the conditions that we've, um, learned about just in the last 18 months. So these are all new to us. Uh, we can, you could ask Dr. Hare about any one of these conditions. You could ask me about most of them and I could tell you a little something about them. I'll give you a couple of stories. The first is about BRAT1. I actually have some experience with BRAT1. This is a particular genetic disorder in that I delivered a child with this about 15 years ago. We didn't know what it was. Basically, we delivered them at the clinic. This child was born and within an hour of birth was stiff and seizing. Uh, it was very frightening. We thought, oh my gosh, what did we do something wrong? Is it something happened? And it became evident though that this was some sort of early antenatal insult that this child had had and ca continued to seize, ended up at uh, Gunderson for a few days, ended up at Mayo, was in the hospital a while, and finally they didn't, no one figured out what it was. They were discharged home for uh, palliative comfort care and this child died you know shortly thereafter but if you can imagine what those costs were I'm gonna say you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for sure um, about three years later I did delivered another child to this family it had the same same condition so it was stiff and seizing right from birth and as soon as I saw that I thought well we know this is an inherited condition and we don't know what it is we sent that child also to Gunderson in that case since they'd already been through it once in the hospital for a month with the first one a few years later I delivered another child to this family and another affected child so this turns out this is an autosomal recessive condition, which means it's, uh, the chances for each pregnancy would be one in four. They, they did have a couple of healthy children in between, but uh, basically they had three of these children, and they were so remarkable, I mean, I would never forget them. So about four years ago, I was in at a con this conference at, uh, with the CSC out east, and I heard a presentation on BRAT1, and as soon as I heard the presentation, I thought, that's what my kids had. They had BRAT1 mutation. And there, so it was only described about uh, at that time, a couple of years prior to that, so maybe five years ago now. So it's no wonder they didn't, they didn't make a diagnosis at Mayo and they didn't make a diagnosis at Gunderson. They didn't really know the diagnosis. There's, there's new things we're doing now where we can solve those problems right from birth, do whole exomes and test the family and begin to, to maybe answer those questions, but it's, it's still early in its infancy. So that's kind of the story. That's the prelude to this. Now one thing I would say that I did not know this when I began this venture. I had this kind of primitive idea that if this is a genetic condition, you kind of, you have it and there's probably a not, a lot of, a, not a lot of things you can do to alter that. But actually, these conditions, there's a certain group of them that fall into that category. They're essentially lethal disorders and nothing that we do really um, changes the course of the disease. There's plenty we can do for comfort and, and palliation for that child, of course, and that family, but we're not changing the course of the disease. And then there's a whole series of these conditions that are ameliable, uh, amenable to therapy. So they're benefited by early knowledge. I'll talk about one in a moment, where if you make the correct interventions, they live richer, fuller lives. And then there are some, if you identify at birth, essentially are healthy, normal people, and they go on, and that's where Dr. Morton's work, he's completely changed the face of some of these conditions where previously all the children were wheelchair bound with multiple strokes and unable to communicate and spastic and seizing and finally dying and now the children are now young adults having their own babies, they're all healthy, all healthy. It's, it's just an unbelievable story. What, and, and the interesting thing is, the categories of illnesses that you see, these genetic conditions, and the frequency, so lethal, uh, improved by care, 
and basically curable mirror pretty much what we see in all of our other work. So the, if you look at diabetes, so that's something that's maybe not curable, but we can do a lot to treat that. Coronary artery disease, same thing, but not all the, and then sometimes we have pancreatic cancer, maybe we can't cure that, and then we got something else that we take that out of melanoma and we cure that. So the, but basically, the ratios are not all that different than the rest of our work, which I, I just found fascinating when I first learned about that. And, and now we're, of course, we're out to do that. Uh, and to save money along the way, so these patients are going to get kind of informed care, knowledgeable care, inexpensive care, the right diagnosis early, and then the proper treatment, saving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars for the communities where they can invest that in proper care for something that needs it, not wasting all this money on care that is of no value. But of course, it's no one's fault. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm only saying if you don't know what a condition is and it's a desperately sick baby, you're going to do all you can to try to help that baby. It's just what we do and it's what the parents would expect. But if you, know, if you can identify it, then you're, you're in a position to either treat it or not. So. In this condition, I don't think I have a slide about BRAT1. Yes, I do here. So this, this occurred in January. So this is after the prelude that I mentioned. In January of this year, we got a call from a midwife in Dalton. So again, our reaching out has helped because they, we get acquainted. We know the midwives. We know the community leaders. And she said, well, we delivered this baby, and this baby is stiff, and it's seizing. So I said, oh, that could be BRAT1. Can you bring the child here? So they actually had had a child with this condition, I think, some six years ago. That child spent a month or so in the pediatric ICU at UW, much like our story at Mayo Rochester, without a diagnosis. <clears throat> So this child, this is their second child, and they've got other healthy children. They brought to the child to our clinic on day two. Of course, I know what the condition is, or at least we suspect it. We're not sure, but we suspect it. So we can do a point mutation test for BRAT1 for 50 bucks. So that's what we did. A positive diagnosis. The child has BRAT1. There is no known treatment. These children all die. So instead of spending the weeks at the hospital, they went home to their children, cared for that little child. Tom and I actually stopped at the house. It's two hours from here, but we had a kind of a meeting in Madison. So we, we, we went out and spent a little time with them. I think on about day th three weeks of life, they thought, oh, he's doing pretty good. But he actually died on day 36 or 37. And so and comfortable, <laughs> comfortable and, and uh, nurtured by his family with the children and the siblings all around. And, and you think of how much money that that saved. Dr. Morton has calculated in the communities that he's working out in, in Ohio, he's saving about $15 million a year with the work that they're doing at that clinic. And of course the care, much better. It's informed care. It's proper care for what the kids need. And if, if the child has a lethal disorder, what does he need? He needs to be home with his family. And that's what they're getting. And then if they have a remediable kind of condition, they need that care. And if they have a curable condition, they need that care. And so they get that. And so it's, it's quite an amazing um, process, what we're learning. Yes? These diseases don't come among the English. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because almost all of these di uh, conditions are in the English as well. Oh. They're just much, much more common in the Amish. So some in the English might be one in a million, and they might be one in 200 in the Amish, for example. So we don't know, like, the gene frequency of all these. We'd have to do, it's kind of hard to get a, a proper population, but. We're looking actually at doing blood spots where we'd test every baby for 200 disorders right from birth, test them for the whole bunch. And you, you know, the, the technology is there where we may be able to do that for 100 bucks. <coughs> yes, Susan. Isn't this a condition though, because of, you have a closed community and so, so you, yes. keep, you keep distilling the genetic uh, yes. It it's called a founder effect, and it's not just in the Amish. There are many populations that have this founder population. So the, I mentioned early on the Ashkenazi Jews. So they, <coughs> they are a community, and they marry within their community. And so there are certain conditions that are completely absent in that, com in that community. So they may have no cetostrolemia. They could have no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, conceivably, even though that's pretty common. Uh, but they might have very high uh, frequency of certain rare conditions, Tay-Sachs disease and others, you know. And the same thing is true, that the country of Iceland is one large founding population. So I'm not saying that there isn't some movement on and off Iceland, but what I'm saying is that 
you know, the, let's say the lion's share of the population comes from a population who came there whenever they came to Iceland, and they've been marrying not so much within a religious or cultural community, but within, you know, their, their, their geographic community. And so, and then there's a, for example, I met a young man, uh, a PA student in Madison when I gave a talk there recently, and he's from a, a Christian sect from the Middle East that moved to India like 1,700 years ago, and they've been marrying within their community in the south of India for, well, 1,700 years. And so they've got, you know, he doesn't know what they've got, but they've got a whole variety of different conditions. Would be completely separate, probably. Could be overlap, but very likely separate. So it's, it's really throughout the communities. So when they find something like some of these conditions, these came from northern Europe in the 1700s when the Amish emigrated here in the 1700s. I should mention that the, the disorders though, are different depending on the community that they come from. So the Ohio, most of our Amish in this area come from Ohio, not all, but most. Uh, so all the original founding people in the 60s came from uh, Northeast Ohio. So the conditions are here are mostly the conditions they see in Northeast Ohio. So when we want to know something, we talk to Hang Wang there at the clinic in Middlefield, and he knows it. But we have some coming from Pennsylvania, and they have completely different disorders. And, uh, and the Mennonites, interestingly, from Northeast Ohio, are almost all former Amish. So their genetic disorders of the Mennonites of Northeast Ohio are about the same as the Amish, but it's different in Pennsylvania. The Mennonites and Amish separated way back in Pennsylvania, so the Mennonite disorders are separate from the Amish disorders in Pennsylvania, whereas they're the same in Ohio. So, uh, let's see where we are. This is a condition I've been studying a lot in the last year. Um, there are about 100 cases. I should mention with BRAT1, there's probably about 20 cases that have been reported in the world literature, so it's a pretty rare condition. This have been about 100 cases in the world literature, the cytosterolemia. One year ago, I'd never heard that word, uh, couldn't pronounce it, uh, but now I have nine patients with this condition. Um, it's a disorder of plant sterile metabolism, so it has to do with the way our bodies absorb the, let's say, uh, canola oil, saffron oil, olive oil, various fruits and vegetables that we eat uh, are absorbed and they can't be excreted. So they actually get levels of this in their blood up to 100 times normal. And uh, though it's not cholesterol, it's kind of chemically related to cholesterol, and it behaves kind of like cholesterol. So these young people develop strokes, heart attacks, uh, sudden death, at, the youngest reported is age five, where the child just died, uh, you know, a 13-year-old having triple bypass surgery for coronary disease, that kind of thing. So I see these little girls, you know, beautiful girl with these noises over their arteries for you medical people, breweries, uh, carotid breweries, and, and I often say they're much like a 75-year-old smoking person, This and yet she's a 13-year-old young girl with these conditions. So this is one of Dr. DeLine's success stories where, you know, he, he got the first information about the girl having high cholesterol and then, you know, having more symptoms than that. And really, within a few weeks, he had made the diagnosis and then which led us to thinking of other patients in the community that had a similar problem. Um, and now, like, we have eight patients with it, and, you know, which is as much as any other site in the world has. Um, and Dr. Line has got a treatment plan going for them, and really it's state-of-the-art care. Um, you know, and we believe that there's more out there that they haven't been diagnosed yet, but I think the more that's written about it, the more that people are going to find it. This is a condition that leads to an unusual lumps on the elbows and knees and other areas. They get these fatty buildup, and then the entire vasculature is plastered with all this thick plaque. It builds up on the aortic valve, and then in the liver, and there's a variety of different conditions associated with it, but especially premature atherosclerosis just means hardening of the arteries, basically the thing that causes strokes and, and heart attacks and circulation problems to your legs. This is seen just in the Amish and also the Hutterite communities, not in the Mennonite communities. Uh, it is seen some in the East Asian populations, so Korea and China, and then a little in, in the Middle East. Uh, those are the primary areas it's been found. The patient on, on the top is actually my patient. He, it's a little tricky getting photos of the Amish sometimes, so 
we have to kind of negotiate, but I said, look at that photo. It's, you can't tell you're Amish. You know, it doesn't show your face, doesn't show your, you know, your clothing or anything. So he did allow me to do that one, but I did send him a request. To, I kind of wanted to get more of them. He's got some really amazing uh, xanthomas, but that's what it looks like kind of on the elbows and the knees. It's a, that's not our patient. That's off the internet. But. So we're doing research on this with one of the pediatric cardiologists at UW, uh, <clears throat> trying to modify this condition so that these young girls can develop a normal life and go on and have children. We have one young woman who's already delivered, so she's 22. And of course, how do you manage a patient like this who has cetostrolemia and who's pregnant? Well, we don't know the answer to that. There's nothing in the literature about it. We've done it once uh, with a lot of analysis, a lot of study, a lot of consultation, <coughs> and manage that uh, condition. But she's got three younger sisters coming along. And we're working on management plans to get these sterile levels down. There are certain medications which will do that. And then there's some binders, like you take this stuff kind of like charcoal that would bind and, and get rid of these sterols without being absorbed so they're safe in pregnancy. That whole issue of a, a management plan during pregnancy and during nursing is really important in the Amish. If you just say, well, we're not going to deal with that because they're pregnant people, you know, which is mostly what the, a lot of the researchers do. They're not used to doing obstetrics and they don't do anything like that. Basically, 80% of the time, for from the time they're 21 until they're 40 or so, they're either pregnant or they're nursing. And we've kind of documented that with our patients in looking at a number of them. So you have to have a plan for how you're going to manage that during pregnancy and during uh, nursing, or you're going to have women who are riddled with, with vascular disease, you know, and having strokes and MI and not be able to enjoy the children that they bear. Did they so, uh, respond to the anti they don't respond to statins. Actually, the, the enzyme system that works with statins is down-regulated in this, so statins do nothing for the condition. There's a, there's a medicine called Zetia or Zetamibe, which works very well for the condition. Um, but so far, the best we've seen is about a 50% reduction in levels. So if they started at 100 times normal, then maybe they're 50 or they're 40 times normal, which is good, but... I don't think it's good enough, so we're working that we're adding these binders. It's not actually charcoal, it's something called cholesterimine, but it's a, we call it a bile acid sequestrant, but it's much like charcoal, it's gritty like sand. The Amish are good with that, They're, they love that kind of stuff, you know, these things they can drink and, and, and take. They do a lot of that, and so, so far we've had, we've had some pretty good cooperation um, working with the family. Of course, this is after six months of education and, and collaborating and learning together. So we're, we are learning about this as a family and as clinicians together. Yes? Is this a condition that can be known at birth? Can you test for yes. it? Yes. Yep. So we, we could know it, and you would want to know it. I think you wouldn't really want to wait until they're lumpy and they've already got uh, bad valves and, and that sort of thing. So and then the intervention starts yes. immediately. Yes. The first thing is diet. If you can imagine, they're on a low plant sterile diet. So all the normal stuff that we talk about for our diets, you know, avoiding butter, avoiding lard, that's what they're supposed to eat. They're not supposed to eat olive oil and all that other stuff. And the whole wheat has got a lot more plant sterols in the in the... So white wheat, <laughs> rice, white rice, all that, white bread. But a lot, there are certain vegetables that are high in plant sterols and certain that are low, so we try to use those. But really, you've got plant sterols in, in a lot of things. But still, you can make a big difference just with the diet. So for example, the young woman who has the condition, this is a recessive condition as well, many of them are, most of these conditions. She has two abnormal genes for cetostrolemia. <coughs> so when she married and she's going to have a child, our question is, is her husband a carrier? If her husband is a carrier, then 50% of their children are going to have two abnormal genes. They're going to have the condition. If, if, and it turned out he was not a carrier, so he had two healthy genes, which means they'll get a, um, a disease-causing di gene from mother and a healthy one from father, and they'll all be carriers, and none of them will be sick. But of course, when they come of age and they marry, then they probably want to do carrier testing on their person that they marry <clears throat> for $50. They know, well, do we need to pay attention to that? Because if they deliver one in four children that might have the condition, then they can know right at birth, make sure they give a good diet, we'll know more by that time, so hopefully have better treatments. And then you stick with things that are non-toxic. You know, we use these like binders first and then uh, med medications later. You'd have to know the history. Yeah. Yep. 
So that's where we begin to test the family. Once we learn about one, we test our siblings. We test the parents' siblings. We send letters of information to all the family members. What are the potential consequences? Offer them screening. If they're interested, you know, if they don't live around here, we can talk to their doctor. They, they don't have to come here. We can just tell them, just do a purple top tube and send it to this lab. And this one they check for now at UW. For $50, they get an answer. And this has only been known in the Amish community for 25 years, and the knowledge has exploded. And you might even wonder, well, why do they even cooperate with all of this? I mean, we're doing these research studies and all of that. It's mostly because of Dr. Morton, <laughs> his, his, the work he's done. I mean, he's been in those communities for 25 years, and, well, I mean, every Amish family almost knows the name of Dr. Holmes Morton because he's done so much for those communities. He's changed the lives of those families. And so when we talk about doing this testing, there's no reluctance. The genetic testing, sure, you know. And uh, even for the, even just for learning about the conditions, we had a patient in the sibling to the father of these, all these kids with this, who actually, the father has the condition. Uh, we were surprised to find he's, 50 years old or so, but he has advanced carotid disease, like, like an 80 year old. Uh, his sister came in to be tested, and she said, well, I feel good, but I, she said, I thought, you're, doing, you're working so hard down here to learn it, and we're trying to help you to help us. So she came in, and hit, here she had it too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, we're working through that. We call that cascade testing. So every family we educate, we not only educate verbally, we write our best description of what this means, carrier state, or if you're homozygous, if you have two two mutations, you have the disease. What does it mean for your siblings? What does it mean for your children? Documents that outline that in clear language for every condition, this is what we're doing. So in some of the Amish will give them like 10 copies, that way they can mail it to their uh, families because they don't really have a printer probably at home. But this is really the whole key. If, if you can begin to identify this stuff, you're gonna save, it doesn't have to be us do it, if they're in Ohio or they're in Iowa or they're somewhere else, they can just do the blood test and figure out you know, what the story is. And if, they've, if they're a carrier, well then maybe they ought to test their partner to see if they're a carrier. And then if they are, they know when this kid is delivered and he's having troubles, do we run to the ICU or do we do, we do uh, cord blood testing and do palliative care, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it can just change the, the entire financial structure of that, of that community. This first patient with cytostrolemia, actually, the, they started out as a family who didn't even want to speak to me. They were so frightened about engaging the healthcare system. So they, they, they only communicated by surrogates. So first the midwife called me. And then when she got me on the phone, then she handed the phone to her husband, who's kind of the herbalist in the community. And then he got and he was saying, well, we have a child, and if we did, had, if we did a cancer test, would, would you have to turn that over to the medical establishment uh, if we do this test? You know, because they're, you know, they're basically anti-chemotherapy, basically, which is understandable. We're all kind of anti-chemotherapy. It's just a matter of dealing with what you have and trying to figure out what you want to do. But, the, uh, but they're fearful, and they're fearful of governmental intervention is what they're really fearful of. And so then it turns out, you know, that the child had some bloody diarrhea, and, you know, but the child never grew and uh, is uh, very, very skinny and very frail and has swollen ankles sometimes and can't walk very far. So it's more than that. It turned out the bloody diarrhea was just a, was a red herring, had nothing to do with uh, the condition. She indeed did not have cancer. And, um, but now this family, they trust me like anything. I mean, they, they're in all the time. And the husband is asking me these questions just like that. Well, if it's this genetic stuff and we're marrying around here, I mean, should I be sending my kids out to New York to, to meet their wives? And should we kind of, you know, these kinds of questions. I said, well, you know, you have to decide. But, but one of the challenges of this is that only about a third of the affected people with this have the lumps. So if you could just look and see, well, you got the lumps and you're in this family, you have cytostrolemia, that would be kind of easy. That's what we thought when we first started. Of course, we're not very smart. But, <laughs> but then when we began doing cascade testing, testing all the siblings, we found, oh, this one also has it, but she doesn't have the lumps. Oh, this one has it too. Oh, this pregnant one, she has it as well, no lumps. No noises over the arteries. So the point is, it's not so easy to tell, and the problem with that is, if you look at heart attacks that occur out in the community, so these are the usual people, men and women, middle-aged or older, have a heart attack, 
we know from the clinicians taking care of these people, how often do they have noise over their arteries? If they have it, it's not good, <laughs> for sure. But most of them don't have that. So it's, what I'm saying is it's not a very sensitive indicator of troubles. And if you just wait until you got noise over the carotid arteries, you're going to be way down. They might have already died suddenly at age 13 or something. So I'm not at all satisfied that the normal exam, the lack of chest pain when they walk uphill if they're 10 years old, is that all that reassuring. I want to know what's the state of the vasculature. So how do you know that? We're really good at doing that with adults. We do it all the time. They have a wide variety of things you do. But <clears throat> including the Amy Peterson, who's kind of their expert in Madison, she said, well, you could do an angiography. I thought, You're not going to do that in a kid. You got all that x-ray, and that's where you squirt dye in the veins and in the arteries and looking for a disease. That doesn't make sense in, a, in a, this kind of population. You've got to do things that are safe, no radiation, easy. You don't want to be sticking a lot of needles in these kids. So what we're actually doing is we're studying the carotid arteries, not like if any of you have ever had a neck artery carotid test. We call it a Doppler, carotid Doppler, not like that. Is something we call CIMT, carotid intima media thickness. The intima in the media is a very thin lining of the, of the artery. We can measure that, and a normal one is about, the whole thing together is about half of a millimeter. So there's 25 millimeters in an inch, so whatever that would be, a 50th of an inch. Anyway, it's a, it's a pretty tiny little measurement. And you can do these measurements, and you can get a sense long before the chest pain and long before the stroke about the state of the vasculature in these children. So that's what we're doing. It's kind of on a research basis. We're doing it. We have to do it cheap or free. We're doing it free, really, because otherwise you couldn't really get them to do it. I mean, it's costing thousands of dollars for these tests. So what we do is cheap. Everything has to be cheap. If it isn't cheap, we just can't do it. I mean, if I can get a treadmill, we'll start just, you know, running them on the treadmill in the office, because I can do that. I know how to do that, but I can't do it at the hospital because it's, you know, a couple thousand dollars. So we do it there, we do it easy, and, and so those are the kinds of things we have to do in order to help this population, and we can do it. We just have to, we can't do everything, but we can do more and more things, and we can solve problems uh, in, in low-cost ways. And this is, so we're, we're studying the, the thickness of the lining of the arteries, and of course we can only do it maybe every three years or so to get a sense of it, so maybe I won't be here in six years, maybe I will, and if I am, we'll be still studying those arteries of these children, hoping to demonstrate that we can stop the progression of this condition. We will see. But it has not been done. This has not been published, anything like that. There have been about 30 papers, even though there's only been 100 patients, it's kind of hard to imagine, but, um, the, uh, but none of them have done anything that, but show, let's say, how low do the blood levels get, which is good, but I want to know what's happening, happening to the vasculature of these children, and that's what we're going to find out. Is that a single gene? Well, yes. It's, it's these are such good questions. Yeah. Yeah. Are not single. That's true. And this is not either. There are actually two genes that, that affect this absorption of these plant sterols, but there are different mutations within these genes. So there are actually two genes, but there's about 25 mutations that have been identified that cause the same we call it phenotype or clinical presentation. But with the Amish, there's only one mutation. So that makes our job kind of easy. You know, we've got a very easy, we just do a point mutation, exactly what we need. We don't have to test all 25. So if you're in another context, then we have to change our approach. In this case, we can do fasting sterile levels, and if they're 100 times normal and they have the disease, then you can go back and figure out the mutation. If they're normal, they don't have the disease, you're done there. Basically, the, that test would be the way to go in the non-Amish. In the Amish, you just test for the point mutation, but it varies a little with each condition. That's why I say informed care. We have to learn this stuff. We have to know. And of course, we don't know much. We only know a little bit on some of these conditions. But we're learning. And uh, each time a question comes up, then we consult with others who have the wisdom. And then we, they also have websites where they have all these things listed so we can just look it up. They've even got something called the list. These are the things that have been found. There's 200 disorders. Some of them are neurodevelopmental. Some of them are cardiac. Some of them cause effects on the kidney. You just look through it. Well, well, could it be this or that? You know, That's basically where we're at. And then as we've seen the condition, then we develop a little bit of expertise, like cetosterolemia.
With the right diagnosis and the proper treatment, as I've kind of demonstrated there, so much can be done for these children, even if they have a lethal disorder. And as Dr. Morton has said, some of his most grateful patients and the biggest donors to his project have been parents of children with lethal disorders. If they have to die, if they can know what it is and save that child all kinds of suffering and IVs and sedated MRIs and, and difficult tests which would normally be necessary, it's really important to do that. I would just like to say that Lafarge has been blessed by having you and now Dr. Hare here. Well, it's been a blessing for us as well. So right. you give what you get and you receive what, so really it's been a, it's been a been a rich experience. I never could have done this if I had been in the practices that most of my peers went to and where my father wanted me to go and, you know, all of that kind of thing 35 years ago. You're a world leader, Dr. Jim. No. <laughs> We're just beginning. We're just beginning. And we do a lot of other work, too, like sewing on fingers and taking <laughs> stuff like that. Let's see if we have anything else. No, that's it. <laughs> If you have time for my annual physical. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing. I'm so, I'm so lucky. Yeah. Because that's. Thank you all for coming. Yeah.